Welcome to a weekly review of North Dakota's legislative news. Now, here's your host, Dave Thompson, with North Dakota Legislative Review. And this is North Dakota Legislative Review. I'm Dave Thompson. Thanks for joining us. For the first time this session, Governor Doug Burgum testified in support of legislation. He also vetoed two bills and signed about 500 others. Political correspondent Chad Miro looks back at what was a busy session for the governor. We're honored to announce that the governor's office today will begin to display the flags of the five tribal nations with whom we share geography alongside our state and national flags outside the governor's office. In An emotional Illinois. start to the 2019 legislative session at the State of the State Address. There, Governor Burgum also proposed changes to the state prison system that would have closed the women's prison in New England. It didn't happen this time, but lawmakers hinted it still could. A study will be conducted and presented in the next session. Then, more reforms surrounding corrections. The first bill signed this session, House Bill 1183, removing mandatory minimum sentences for certain drug-related crimes, giving the courts more flexibility with sentencing. Some bills the governor didn't sign. His first veto blocked a bill that would have doubled driver's license fees. He won that fight. His next veto? To stop a bill that gave the budget section spending authority in the interim. That veto, though, was overturned. Then, there was his testimony to Congress. He appeared before the Senate Education Committee to push for a multi-board system for higher education. Lawmakers instead decided to expand the existing board. Then his testimony for the Presidential Library. The Theodore Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum would be destined to become the number one tourist attraction in the state of North Dakota. He testified twice in the last week of session. He got the funding, but that's just the beginning. This is a challenge to donors everywhere. The state it's still needs to raise $100 million in private donations. The work never ends, and neither does the job of the governor. We're now joined by our guest, Governor Doug Burgum. Governor, thanks for being here. Dave, great to be with you, and thank you for all the hard work you put in during the legislative session. We appreciate it. You know, 21, 21 sessions, 21 wow. sessions covering this. So. Wow, incredible. Well, let me just ask you, what was your impression of the session this year? Well, I thought some uh, great work was done, and I want to just start out with a shout out to uh, the legislature, the, the new freshmen, the, the veterans, the legislative leadership. Uh, they introduced over 930 bills, uh, over 500 of those passed, uh, and I think that the ball was moved forward on a number of fronts for North Dakota. Where specifically do you see the ball being moved forward? Well, I think there were some uh, big things that were accomplished uh, in behavioral health. That was, uh, I think, uh, some great work that's being done and uh, a lot of awareness that's being raised across the statewide about the uh, importance for both you know, behavioral health, the disease of addiction, and that this is something that we is, does, reaches across party lines. It's not about the House versus the Senate, Republican or Democrats, but this touches every family and every community uh, in the state, every business. And, and I think there's a growing realization that we've got to tackle that. And we have to tackle that both in terms of how we think about uh, reinventing uh, how we approach our criminal justice, how we think about uh, reinvesting our approach to recovery and addiction, and how we think about uh, serving those that are in, the struggling with the disease of addiction or the disease of mental health related diseases. And I, I think there is a lot of progress there. Infrastructure, uh, you know, a lot of attention early on, a lot of support for statewide infrastructure bills. And we're, we're so fortunate to be in a position in our state where economy is strong and particularly to be what's now, when we're the number two oil producing state and we've got the entrepreneurs, the innovators, the risk takers that have developed that industry in our state and then the state gets 10% of the revenue off the top that comes into various funds. I mean, we're just, uh, in a financial situation, we're just so much stronger than virtually every other state. And we're a small state like this, uh, we have an opportunity to really do some innovative things and, and uh, funding infrastructure is another one. Uh, some big changes made in uh, K-12 funding, uh, higher education and higher education bonding. Uh, so new activity going on there. I mean, our K-12 payment will now, for the first time in the history of the state, the state will over $10,000 per student, so huge commitment. Uh, we were able to get back in giving raises for state employees uh, that we had to, during the downturn. Uh, we had to, uh, uh, you know, put those on hold. Uh, but now that we're rolling again, we're able to get back on that track. So I'd say that, you know, everywhere you look, there was uh, progress made. A lot, quite a change from two years ago when the state faced some, some fairly substantive cuts because of 
not having the revenue. Well, yeah, it's a remarkable change from just two years ago, and and uh, where we had to take, you know, two years ago, I had to take, you know, one point seven billion dollars out of the general fund from six billion down to four point three, and uh, that's, you know hadn't had to happen really since the depression that kind of a percentage and a dollar biggest cut ever to be able to come back and now to be able to to go from there and start adding dollars back in there's a lot more fun than having to it's more fun to add a few dollars back in than to cut dollars out and i just remembered that i covered the legislature when we had our first billion dollar budget so that that's been a few years ago so yeah and i think again i would say again there was a lot of smart investments that were made, but also there was a tremendous amount of fiscal restraint, uh, making sure that we're you know, living within our means. Uh, we've been able to rebuild a number of the savings accounts that we had to deplete, deplete uh, during the last downturn. Uh, you know, and this budget that was passed uh, is $2 billion below the peak budget North Dakota passed, and it's still uh, over a billion dollars lower than we were uh, when we took office. And so I think it's still a fiscally conservative approach to what we're doing, and, uh, and yet we've been able to take care of our priorities. The Legacy Fund has now, the, the, the money is available for the general fund, but there's going to be that study about what to use the Legacy Fund proceeds to, to, to use, what we're gonna use them for. So I'm just kind of curious, do you have some ideas on what to use the proceeds from the Legacy Fund for? Well, when, when we gave the budget address last December, we laid out four criteria, which I think are uh, still uh, reflect uh, what the voters of the state uh, intention was when they passed uh, the legacy fund. Uh, and the first one was that we would be investing in projects uh, that would have a create, create a lasting legacy, that they would have an impact beyond a generation. The second thing was that we wanted to have it not just be for you know, one institution, one community, but it would have a regional, a state, a national, or even international impact uh, for our state. Uh, and that could be, you know, helping diversify the economy or improve tourism, uh, improve, you know, work on workforce, but you pick it, but it's got to have a regional, national, or, or international impact. Uh, the third thing we said, it should go towards things that are one time only, not funding general government, because when you fund general government and grow it, you create a bow wave of expenses that have to be paid for in each of the following years. So looking for things where we could do one time projects, whether that's creating an endowment or a capital project, uh, was the third criteria. So if you had uh, lasting impact beyond a generation, uh, broad impact geographically, uh, one-time spending only was the third criteria, but then the, the so it doesn't grow government. But then the, the 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 fourth one, which we felt was key, was leverage, which is we take a state tax dollar, take the earnings off the legacy fund because none of it was recommending spending the principal, but take the earnings and then match that with the private sector, uh, match it with leverage, maybe through revolving infrastructure funds, but you know funds, but increase the impact. So in our budget, we had. Uh, suggested $300 million of legacy fund projects that would actually would have had a billion dollars of impact uh, through that l last component of leverage. And the one thing that really stood out to everybody was the proposal for a Theodore Roosevelt Library to be built in Medora. You had originally planned to take $50 million out of the legacy fund. Legislature didn't buy it, and they came up with a different funding proposal, $35 million in Bank of North Dakota loans, $15 million from existing money in the general fund. Good move on that part? Well, I think there's a, uh, two things. One is I, I want to quote a majority leader from the Senate, Rich Wardner, who said, no matter how you cut it, this is a legacy project. And I think he's absolutely right because this project, the Theodore Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum, meets all four of those criteria. Uh, the legislature, they're the appropriators. They get to decide uh, which bucket they pull funds from. Uh, the legacy funds do end up in the general fund, and so if they choose uh, to fund it through a different approach, that's, that's the uh, legislative prerogative. Uh, but I think in the end of the day, we st they, they, the legislature came together and overwhelmingly passed uh, what I think will become a, one of the, the first and signature legacy project, hopefully not the last, uh, because we're going to be in a position as a state uh, to dream big about doing projects like this in the future. And I think the funding mechanism that they came up with, which is create an endowment that's going to be held by the state of North Dakota that can't be accessed until the $100 million of private money is raised. And then when the hundred million is raised and the library is operational, then the endowment pays for the maintenance and operation. So this is a very smart, high return on investment approach for how we use legacy funds. 
because if we just keep legacy funds now, they get invested on Wall Street. We pay Wall Street fees. So that says two things. It says if we're just going to put it in a savings account on Wall Street, it says we don't think there's any high return on investment projects in North Dakota. Uh, you know, those two things. We can't beat the market and we can't invest in North Dakota. I think we can do both of those things. We can get returns higher than the market and we can invest in North Dakota. And the library proves that because when we get a hundred million dollars of outside capital before a dollar of state money uh, even leaves that endowment, that's a great return for the taxpayers. And, and uh, I think we can do that over and over with new projects. Would love to hear other people's ideas. It's no secret that there was a lot of hesitation, we'll put it that way, at the start of the session to do the library project. But that seemed to change and it, it got a lot of support toward the end. What do you think did it? Well, I think two things. One is I think the legislature uh, came to do their job, which is represent their constituents. And I think they came in and said, hey, we need to take care of long-term care. We need to take care of teachers. We need to take care of roads. And when they realized that we had the ability to do all those things, uh, you know, fund increases for long-term care, because, you know, all in, we got a very large increase for long-term care. Uh, we've got, you know, the salary increases for, we got increases in higher ed, K-12. Uh, so when they said, hey, when we've taken care of all of our priorities, behavioral health, now we can look at, really start looking at things that would be extra on top of that. And I think the other piece is, as the, the session progressed, uh, legislators started understanding that the, the actual structure of this, you know, creating an endowment that was held by the state and only the earnings are used until the hundred million comes in. I think they all started going, hey, this is a pretty smart way to finance legacy projects. And I think that uh, some of it was the project and some of it was the structure of the deal that was created by the legislature. Do you know how close the $100 million is at this point? Well, we've had indications of over half of that uh, from donors, but really have to look at the, when the legislation was signed uh, last week, uh, that this is the starting line, not the finish line, because there's a lot of work to be done. And, and I, you know, we have had $100 million campaigns, private and public universities in North Dakota. They're rare, but not impossible. But this will be a first of its kind because the, the Theodore Roosevelt Presidential Library is like a startup. I mean, there's not, there's no, can't like access a mailing list and call the 50,000 alumni, you know, from that institution. You're starting from scratch. So the fact that we've got over half already verbally committed uh, is remarkable. And I think there's a lot of uh, both state and national interest for this project. And I'm, I'm optimistic that that money can be raised by the Library Foundation. Now, one of the things that you proposed early in the session was to move people, the women out of the uh, New England facility to Bismarck, move the Bismarck people over to Jamestown and put them in the existing state hospital, build a new state hospital. The legislature didn't go that far. However, there is going to be a two-year study and they're going to fund it with $400,000, finding some consultants to look at the whole correction system. Is that acceptable to you? Well, I, I think it's a, a positive step in the right direction uh, because we have a, a, a duty uh, at, at the state uh, when people are uh, incarcerated, when we have residents that are part of our, our system, uh, we're responsible for their, for their health care, for their feeding. Uh, we also should be concerned about their uh, opportunities for education, for their, uh, for their recovery, because so many of the people that are in the correction system uh, suffer uh, from the disease of addiction and possibly other uh, health issues. And so uh, it's, it's important because, you know, our, the system, which we spent hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars on, uh, should be about how do we make better neighbors, not better prisoners. And it should not at all be about the government jobs associated with that. It shouldn't be about, uh, it, we shouldn't be fighting for a prison in a community the way we fight for, you know, a university because it's not, it's not the job of government to create corrections job. It's our job is to, to focus on the R, the, the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. And we, and so I think it's fantastic that they're doing a, a study to look at the entire system to see if there's a way where we can do this better and more efficiently. When I've had an opportunity to meet with the leaders from other states, uh, like the uh, the woman that leads the corrections in Michigan or the leader that with the new governor in Florida uh, is part of recently when the first lady and I were at the White House relative to the First Step Act, which was federal legislation that's reinventing the way the federal government is doing the federal prison system. Uh, you know, they're closely tying vocational education to the 
to the prison locations. So you, in Michigan, they have called vocational villages where if someone is uh, incarcerated, uh, then when they're coming out, they've got a trade. We, we've got 30,000 jobs open in our state. And one of the reasons that people end up back in prison after they come out is because the discrimination that we put against someone with a felony, because we discriminate against where they can live. We discriminate, uh, 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 you know, sometimes on employment in terms of how we approach employment. Uh, so they, we take someone who's already paid their debt to society completely, and then we put a bunch of barriers in front of them uh, that for any of us might be hard uh, to overcome, to try to get back in to being a positive contributing member of society, and then they end up back in the system. And when they're in our system, incarcerated, it's $41,000 a year. I say we could, we could be sending them all to a private university for less money than that. And so, uh, you know, so again, other states uh, you know, are taking an approach where if someone's gonna be in prison for the next four years, give them a counselor like you would a freshman in college and make sure that four years later when they're leaving prison that they've actually essentially have a, uh, a trade or a degree or a certificate so that they have a chance of, of becoming a contributing member, reuniting with their family. Uh, so I think there's a lot of work we can do there, and this is the, not only the right thing to do, it also saves taxpayer money. So it's beyond bricks, mortar, and punishment. It's removing the barriers, and I suppose that's, that's the real challenge. Well, it is, because it's not just about a physical facility where someone's incarcerated. It's about all the wraparound services uh, that, uh, that we need to do to, to support those people as they're, while, they're in, uh, that while they're in our care and while they're in the system, and how do we, when we get them out, to make sure they don't come back. Were there any big disappointments, things that you'd like to see the legislature have done that they came up short on? Well, I think we had a big opportunity even right up to the last day uh, to, do, to deliver on-time funding for K-12. Uh, you know, there's a tremendous uh, K-12 education bill with a number of advances that are in it. Uh, but right now, uh, we pay on a year lag. So any of our places where we've got growing students are across the state which is also the places where our fastest growing communities, which is also the places where we've got the most job openings, which is where we've got to get families to move to, sometimes from out of state. When they're thinking about taking a job in North Dakota, they check on you know, how, how's the school district doing? And we're, we're essentially handicapping all of our high growth school districts when we don't pay them for the students that are there. And in some cases, the growth is extreme, whether it's I call the three W's, Williston, Watford City, and West Fargo, uh, you know, 300, 330, 460 new students. I mean, that's more than an entire school district showing up in the fall. You know, this last fall, more than an entire school district showed up. We have 100 school districts with less than 250 people. So when you have more than 300 show up, it's like dumping a school district on top of a school district, and then we don't pay for it until the next year, and that's quite a burden uh, for the school. So, and we've got the money, the money's available. In the plan, we move to half-time, off-time funding in the second year, and then we do it over the next five years after that. We finally get to on-time funding. Uh, this is something I'd love to see the legislature pick up when they come back in two years and say, let's just get to on-time funding now and take care, of the, take care of the students that are there. So they took baby steps when they could have taken more strides, perhaps. Yes, yeah, and, and I wanna say too, that sometimes the resistance in the past to on-time funding is if you move when the cash is paid for the students up, well, that means that people that were declining would get less, but this, the, we have uh, tens of millions of dollars now approaching $50 million in the budget for uh, basically hold harmless safeguard payments for the, for the schools that are declining. So we're spending $50 million on the schools that are declining, but we missed the chance to spend $27 million this year on the schools that are growing. Another thing that maybe you could say legislators came up short on was the change in governance on higher education. You pushed a, a three-board solution, then a two-board solution, and they came up with an expanded 15-member board. How do you stand on that now? Well, ultimately, this is going to be up to the citizens to decide because any change in higher education governance has to be decided at the ballot box. So uh, the voters will get a chance to get educated on this topic and, and vote in the fall, fall of 2020 on this topic. But uh, it's a, the whole purpose of the year-long task force was to try to come up with a, an approach that would appreciate the, ch the challenges that are being brought 
by powerful forces, uh, economic forces, technological forces, demographic forces. Uh, these are all things that are pushing on the way higher education and education in general is delivered. And we have a 1938 model uh, that was created in our constitution for a, uh, a single board that's trying to manage, you know, seven person board plus one student member managing enormous complexity. And everyone agreed that something had to be done. Uh, but doubling the size of the 1938 board is not going uh, to, in my mind, it's not going to help any more than if you took a school board uh, that was challenged by demographics, economics, and technology and said, oh, I have a solution. We'll double the size of your local school board and it'll make it all better. No, that's not going to solve the problem for the institution. So, so we're, um, you know, that debate, I guess, will continue and the citizens get to participate in it. But my real concern is, is how do we make sure that we as a state, when we spend over $2 billion on higher education, how do we make sure that we're investing that dollars and providing the governance in a way where we can have, you know, great education for everybody involved in higher education, but how do we do it in a way where we're, we're being uh, efficient with taxpayer dollars in a world where, in a world where uh, you can basically achieve uh, knowledge transfer and learning sort of any time, any place, on any device. It's no longer combined, confined to a campus. Uh, and I'm sure we got many listeners today that are taking online classes and they're taking online classes from institutions that aren't in North Dakota. And so the, the idea that, a, uh, that our state boundary protects us somehow when we think about higher education is just a fallacy because uh, those, those boundaries uh, they don't exist in the in the world that we're entering. I've heard some whispering that somebody might bring up a const, uh, their own measure concerning governance. So it might be a two or three board measure. Have you heard anything about that? Have you been asked to be involved in anything like that? I've not been asked to be involved in it, but of course we had a lot of people that were interested in the, that that were either on the task force or coming to task force meetings, and so not surprising that there are people that have interest there. But it's a uh, uh, that would be something organic that would uh, uh, come from the, you know, come from, from the, the grassroots, yeah, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. And do you you vetoed a couple of bills? Are, are there any vetoes on your on your desk right now? Well, we get uh, as you, as you know, uh, we just uh, session wrapped up last Friday night after 10 p.m. Uh, 53 bills were delivered, including most appropriation bills were delivered uh, to. Uh, uh, to my desk, uh, you know, over the weekend, uh, we had Secretary Purdue was here with Senator Hovind, Senator Kramer was busy with them on Saturday. We were back to work on Monday, and my team has uh, been at the office past midnight, uh, both Monday and Tuesday, going through those 53 bills, and uh, we'll uh, ha have to see what uh, what the future holds in terms of if there's more vetoes. Well, one thing I've been hearing, and you see this on social media, is that they'd like you to do a line item veto on the auditor's budget, where they the auditor's budget now has language that they have to go to the Legislative Audit and Fiscal Review Committee before he does any kind of performance audit. And I, are you getting some pressure to veto that? I wouldn't say pressure, but getting a lot of suggestions. Uh, you know, and this goes back to uh, one of the vetoes earlier in the session on the, what was called budget section, which goes back to last session's debate uh, about where do you draw the line between the uh, the authority of the executive branch versus the legislative branch. And so uh, apparently that is, that's an edge that is going to continue to be uh, uh, contested. Uh, and those that are, you know, suggesting a veto that of that section in the auditor's bill, you know, believe that that's uh, overreached by the legislature. Could there be a, another potential lawsuit? Uh, I, I think uh, with, you know, last time, uh, you know, we left here, we made some vetoes, and the legislature made a choice to uh, spend taxpayer dollars uh, suing the, the governor's office. Ultimately, the Supreme Court decided in favor of the governor's office, and so, uh, you know, but apparently there's an appetite for, for, for those kinds of battles. Uh, you know, w w I would like to uh, think, and we did say, hey, there's a collaborative way where we could move forward. Uh, there's maybe there's a way to resolve things without lawsuits, but I did when I took office part of the oath of office is you You know swear to support the Constitution of North Dakota And so if things come across that appear to be unconstitutional I'll continue to say that and continue to fight for the Constitution and fight for the separation of powers uh, between the branches because the legislature can have us things like budget section they can have a subset uh, they just can't delegate executive authority to themselves 
And, and then the part which makes me always smile on this is that some of the things that we're fighting over, uh, you know, in the end of the day, we got a $14.6 billion budget for the, for the state to run on. And the legislature feels apparently comfortable on 99.9% .9 of it that the executive branch, uh, that they can hold us accountable for how we execute till they come back. But on one tenth of 1% ends up in the budget section where they want to be the executive branch of that last little piece of dollars. Uh, and in any accounting sense, that would be an immaterial portion. So uh, I want to assure the, all the listeners out there that, uh, that on 99.9% .9 of it, we're in agreement with the legislature and we're moving forward and doing our job of executing as the executive branch. Uh, but there seems to be some institution in interesting, constant for the uh, constitutional scholars, there's always going to be that last one-tenth of 1% 1 to, uh, to, uh, to maybe uh, have a, a dialogue over. Okay, I've just got a few seconds left, so I have to ask the question. Are you going to run for re-election? Well, right now we're focused on uh, doing the great job we can every day for the people of North Dakota and finishing up this session. And, and uh, that, that is a decision that will have to be made in the next uh, six months or so, uh, looking ahead to 2020. But right now we're just focused on doing the job. All right. Thank you, Governor, for Thank taking you, the time. Thank you, Dave. And that is Legislative Review. I'm Dave Thompson. Thanks for joining us.